none of us have enough time to do all the things we want. So you have to start prioritizing and triaging the things that you want to do. I also think a lot of us moms and myself included, don't always use the time we spend in the car as efficiently as we could be. You could dictate your book or your ideas to Siri while you're on your way to pick up or drop off. Hi friends, this is Read and Write with Natasha podcast. My name is Natasha Tynes and I'm an author and a journalist. In this channel, I talk about the writing life, review books and interview authors. Hope you enjoy the journey. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Read and Write with Natasha. Today, uh, I have with me a children's author. Uh, her name is uh, Rebecca Lenny. So Rebecca Lenny is, she refers to herself as a mompreneur. And uh, she authored for the first time uh, a children's book. Uh, it's right here. It's called The Growing Bed. And she, she wrote this book after struggling to find a way to get her young son to sleep in his own bed throughout the night. So Re- Rebecca inspires other parents struggling and uh, to find a, a way to deal with their kids and how to deal with, uh, you know, with using a sense of empathy and um, all the, the good stuff that parenthood in, entails. So Rebecca, uh, welcome to the show and um, thank you for joining us today. So If we can start by you telling us what is the story of uh, this book, The Growing Bed, which I actually enjoy. I read and enjoyed and I read it with my five-year-old son as well. So please, the floor is yours and you can tell us what The Growing Bed is all about. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me today. Um, I love listening to your podcast, so it's almost a bit surreal being on it too. So, um, because I never set out in my life to be an author, I, I'm what I like to call an accidental author. Um, but okay, so thank you so much for having me. So, the growing bed uh, is a fictional story based completely on true events of uh, the fact that my son, like you mentioned, would not sleep th- in his own bed through the night until he was, gosh, almost four, four and a half years old. So we were, my husband and I were tired for a very, very long time. (laughs) And uh, as many sleepless uh, nights-induced parents have done, they will try anything to get their kid to fall asleep. If you had told me that bathing my son in a pool of jello would have made him sleep, I would have said, what color, what flavor I'm in, I would have done it. Uh, and so the the story of the growing bed is the one concept that actually worked and got my son to sleep through the night in his own bed. Because as many of us know, your kids will sleep through the night all night long in your bed, but then that means no one's really getting that good of a night's sleep. So yeah. the growing bed uh, solved solved the pain point of my son feeling like he wasn't able to do a lot of the things he wanted, like ride the roller coasters and go on the monkey bars and things like that, while at the same time solving my husband and I's pain point, which was that we needed a good night's sleep, and that involved my son not being in bed with us throughout the whole night. Hmm. I mean, I, I love uh, the idea that you told him, if you sleep your, in, in your bed, you will grow and then you'll do the fun stuff. So how did you get this idea? And did it did it actually work? Uh, yes, it did work. Now, did it work overnight and immediately? Of course not. No, no, no habit can be fixed overnight for the most part, you know, but it was definitely the concept that resonated him, with him the most and the most quickly and the most effectively. So how I came up with it, the idea, I don't know. How do we, you know, how did many people come up with their ideas? My guess is it was, again, in a sleep and de- sleep-induced <laughs> state where I was just grasping for straws, trying to find anything, trying to say anything that would resonate with him and kind of give him that light bulb moment to ex- to say, oh, yeah, okay, that's why. Because, you know, he's a little small for his age, according to American standards. We like to say he's Ikea-sized, but <laughs> um, nothing's wrong with him. He's just a little on the petite side, yeah. but neither my husband or I are, are big people. So he was, he was having a hard time, as any 
four or five year old would wrapping his head around the fact why his friends that were the same age or younger than him were able to do things he couldn't do like ride on the roller coasters or the water slides or, or mm, reach mm. the monkey bars, things like that. So we, you know, we had to explain to him when you're in mommy and daddy's bed, we're done growing. We go to bed to relax and rest and recharge. But when you go to bed, when kids go to bed, it's to grow. And that was like the light bulb moment for him. Mm. And it it became a concept that we could take with us, literally. When we would go on vacation, we'd walk into a hotel room, there'd be two beds in the hotel. And we're like, all right, buddy, which one's the growing bed? Or when he went to grandma's house and spent the night, she had you know, the guest room set up or whatever. And you'll read in the story without giving too much away how to turn any bed into a growing bed. And so it, it's something, the concept could travel with us, which is very important, I think, especially since we all like to travel as much as we can now that the world's back open and, and we don't want to leave our kids behind, but we also don't want to sacrifice anyone's sleep while you're on the road. Hmm. I, I love it. So how, how old is he now? He is now nine and a half. So the struggle is not as prevalent as it was, you know, back in the day, but the book wasn't published till he was about seven. So by then he knew full well that this book was about him and, <laughs> uh, and, and he, th- he thinks it's cool. You know, his school library has put the book in their library. Oh, that's and nice. I've yeah. had, I've had, oh, I know. That was like the most special thing that happened because libraries are forever. That book will be in that library you know, for ages and ages to come. So he does know that the the story is about him. He gets a kick out of that and um, wants to know what what book he's going to be in next. So we'll see. Oh, wow. (laughs) So can he ride the roller coaster now? (laughs) He can now ride the roller coaster. He can now... You know, he wanted to get it out out of that, you know, those five point harness car seats. He wanted to get out of that. He's now in a booster seat, things like that. Uh But it's funny because the goal just changes. So now he wants to be able to go on one of those. um, You've seen those like surf simulators that they have at water parks where it's like an endless wave going and going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now he needs to get to, I think it's 52 or 54 inches he needs to get to. And he's just this close. So we'll see if the. The growing bed can come in handy for a nine and a half year old too. <laughs> he needs to keep sleeping in his bed uh, to know. get there. So, yeah. so you mentioned that your son wants to know if there's uh, there's a another book coming in. You know, um, and is is there a new book coming? Just curious. There would I have other books floating around in my head. I know you've you've chatted with other guests on your podcast about this, and I think most authors say the same thing for a while. I think they say just just give me a hot minute with this book. Let's see how this book does. Let me have fun and enjoy the fruits of the labor from this book. But I think for those of us that have these ideas in us, there's always something else you could write about. Like right now, my my son really, really wants a dog. And my husband and I don't want a dog. And let's be honest, if we got a dog with a nine and a half year old, we would be doing the lion's share of the work. So, you know, kind of thinking maybe I could put some of the ideas we've had about talking mm. to him about getting a new dog into a book. So, okay. you know, they're just tools in our parenting tool belt, right? I'm no sleep expert. It's I'm, I don't have a doctorate. I'm a mom who had a great idea who worked that worked for our family and then had enough other people tell me that that was an actual good idea and that I should do something with it. So if it works for other families, great. So I'm just going to go back to this idea about other families. So you said that you're now helping other families with the same idea. Do you know of any parents who ad- adopted your idea and had any success? Absolutely. I, uh, you know, I had heard, you know, how moms sit around the proverbial campfire and, and commiserate and share stories and laugh and cry and all those things together. And I think what, what, what a lot of us do is share struggles that we're having in our own family and solutions that have worked for our family. So that was something I did in my village of moms. And enough of them had said, you know what, Rebecca, this is actually a really good idea. I'm going to try it. Or you should do something with that idea or, or et cetera, et cetera. And so that's what prompted me to put pen to paper. And then when I presented the manuscript to the publisher, um, the call I got was from a lady named Karen Anderson. And she literally, I picked up the phone. I said, this is Rebecca. And she said, I have seven grandchildren and I wish I had had this book when they were all young. And I was like, oh, does that, does that mean you like the book and you're going to, 
you're going to buy it? And she said, absolutely. So that was um, very encouraging. But I, you know, to this day, I get text messages or um, pictures and whatnot from other moms and other families who have bought the book and really like the book and that mm. it's worked for them. And that, and again, you're not going to see an overnight difference. This isn't a guarantee, you know, 90 day money back guarantee kind of thing. But most children that have read it, the families have said that they do, they do see a difference because it, it makes going to bed exciting. I think a lot of kids struggle with wanting to go to bed on their own because they think they're going to miss out. Whereas this book kind of shows that if you go to bed and you have a good night's sleep, you actually get something out of it. So that's been, I think, the big difference for a lot of children. So, so you're a full-time mom now. So would you consider yourself now as well an, a full-time author uh, since, um, you know, you want to get into this? Is, is that what you have in, you know, in your plans for the future? I, you know, I don't know. You never say never. Um, I was not a full-time stay-at-home mom when I wrote the book. I actually have a what I call my bread and butter career. Um, okay. I run a design agency, and 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 it just kind of happened that I became an author. My husband had the best quote a few years ago, and he said, hmm, "I'm married to an author." Didn't see that coming, and I was like, "Well, you and me both." Okay. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, the stars just aligned um, as far as me getting introduced to the publisher and then them wanting to um, pick up the book so quickly and finding an illustrator and then having all of that process be done during the thick of the pandemic um, was actually a bit of a blessing in disguise, if I'm if I'm being honest. But, you know, I would never say I won't write another book, but I would never say that I, I have no intention to not write okay. another book. So. So are, are you still working in advertising or, um, you know, uh, being a mom is your full-time job now? Oh, I'm still working. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're always moms, you know, even when our kids aren't underfoot or in the same house, we're always thinking about them and what needs to get done and stuff like that. So I, but I'm, I'm not a full-time stay-at-home mom. I do okay. have a quote-unquote other, you know, other job still. Okay, okay, okay. So I, I want to ask you about the publishers. So it's uh, Morgan James kids, right? So I, I think you're the third author that I have on this podcast from Morgan James. So which is which is curious. Um, so how how did you um, get? How did you find them? What was your publishing journey? Did you try with pitching to agents? How did you get here? How did you publish? I had uh, a lady in my life. Uh, not a coworker, a colleague. We we met at different networking events um, in the San Diego area, things like that. And we knew each other from some college connections and business connections and whatnot. And she had just started writing a book. And she told me about her publisher and the experience and how it was going and how she was really enjoying it. And I kind of had, you know, I'd already been thinking about the growing bed and maybe I should put pen to paper, et cetera, et cetera. And this young lady's name's Abby. And I said, you know, if Abby can do it, I can do it too. And not okay. in like a mean girl kind of way. In like <laughs> okay. a, she's an actual person I know and that I've had lunch and drinks with and coffee with. And, and she's writing a book. Like she's a real person. She's not um, some author you just see on the shelves. You know, I actually know okay. somebody who's writing a book and has a publisher. Okay. Okay. And it was like, if she can do it, I can do it. Let's take a stab at it. So she ended up, um, she ended up introducing me to her publisher, okay. um, the lady Karen I had told you about from Morgan James. And the rest really was, again, just a perfect aligning of stars. I was introduced to the publisher. Um, they told me their processes and, and what they're looking for. And then I needed to submit the manuscript. And I was like, um, yeah, yeah, I've got a manuscript. <laughs> Didn't have a manuscript. At that okay. point, it was literally all just in my head. It was okay. This was just the growing bit was just in my head. Okay. So I was like, mm, yep, I'll I'll get you that manuscript, sure. So finally put pen to paper, got her the manuscript. Obviously, it looks a little different than how the final result came, but it was also a combination of they were also trying to increase their presence in the children's book market. So okay. it was it was a perfect collision of me needing a publisher, them liking the story, and also saying this would be a good way for us to increase our presence in the children's market. And that's 
kind of how it went. Got the acceptance letter, got the enormous signing bonus. And I say that very sarcastically <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then got, then got going, finding a illustrator and getting it all done. Okay. So is, is it a hybrid publisher or, um, is it, um, so did, did they take care of all the publishing costs or did you have to chip in? If, if you don't mind me asking, uh, I chipped in uh, a little bit mainly because the way they like to publish children's books, especially is they like them to be, uh, softback, a uh, paperback, if you will. And I just, that didn't sit right with me. I, you know, if this was going to be my only book and it was going to be on the shelves and people were going to hold it and, and give it as gifts and things like that, I really, really, really wanted it to be a hardback book. Okay. And so because of that, um, I was willing to take on some of the publishing costs, um, because I believe in the book and be, and, and they were, happy to accommodate. Um, I wouldn't have had to if it was going to be a soft back, but you know, I just kind of always, you know, when you walk through the bookstores, the few that are still remaining, you don't see a lot of soft back thin, um, paperback, if you will, Correct. books yeah. on the shelf, yeah. right there, especially in the kids section, especially because yeah, um, yeah. they're not that sturdy. Kids need a sturdy book. So I, I did have to um, contribute a bit in that way, but they have, they have done all the traditional things, getting it on the shelves, getting it online, um, marketing, things like that. So it's very much still a, a team team effort. And they've been wonderful to work with. Just oh, absolutely okay. wonderful. Okay. And and how is how is the book uh, doing in, in terms of sales? It's doing well. It's doing well. I see the um, ups and downs based on how much time I put into it, obviously, just like with any business, if you treat it like a hobby, it pays like a hobby. If you treat it like a business, it pays like a business. Okay. Um, so like you said, you, you know, we still have children and I still have an, a, another quote unquote real job. So when I am able to devote a lot of time and effort and, and do a lot of interviews and um, local readings and book signings and things like that, obviously it, it does better, but it's, you know, it lives on the places where most people buy books, Amazon or Target or Walmart and all those places, Barnes and Noble. So it, it ebbs and flows but the beauty of the growing bed is that it's a timeless concept. It's not, you know, it's not a book you just get around Easter. It's not a book you just put in, um, in Chris in stockings. It's not just a Christmas book. So there will always be sleepy kids and sleepy parents till the end of time. <laughs> so okay. it's not going anywhere. <laughs> what, what kind of feedback you got from you know, random reviewers online? Um, anything that, you know, annoyed you? <laughs> You know, because, you know, we are as authors, we get both a positive and negative. So I'm sure. just curious and how you dealt with it. I haven't seen much negative. Actually, I don't think I've ever seen any negative feedback in writing. Thank God. Either I just haven't found it yet or 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 someone's being kind and screening it. You do hear through the grapevine every now and then like, oh, I could have written that or something, you know, little okay. snarky comments like that. Okay. And I'm like, OK, well, yeah, you could have written it, but you didn't. Yeah. And I have a book and you don't, I mean, you just got to let things roll off the roll off your back kind of thing. Um, you know, I, a lot of friends during the pandemic were like, okay, wait, your pandemic project was getting a book published. I made sourdough bread. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I didn't make any bread during the pandemic. So how about we trade a loaf for a book? And, you know, <laughs> so we, we all have different strengths and um, I think it's more so being willing to take that risk and put yourself out there. Um, not that other people don't have amazing ideas. I think a lot of people are just hesitant to run with them. Mm. It's amazing how many people came up with, with projects during the pandemic, especially books. It's, I know. It's I just, know. We're going to look back at this time and, and realize that, you know, it's, you know, how, how different life was and what came out of it. So... But for you, right. you know, a book came out of it. Yeah. So what was your writing process like when, when you wrote it? Like you said that they asked you for a manuscript. So like how long did it take you to like finish the manuscript and send it? And when did you write it? Was it like before going to work? You know, like did you wake up early while the kid was asleep? I mean, I'm interested in sort of the mechanics and the routines because this is what stops many people is like, oh, I don't have time. I can't do it, you know, and, and all of that. Yeah. Right. So I had, and I can never remember 
the author's name, shame on me, but I had heard an interview by this one author who had this idea in his head for a book and needed to get it down and written on paper, but it seemed like such an insurmountable task that he kept putting it off because he didn't know where to start. And what ended up helping him were getting a bunch of different three by five cards in different colors and writing these different concepts on the three by five cards. So I always have some handy. So I'm here at my desk. So here, like say here's a purple one and a, and a green one. So I would write down roller coasters on the purple one. And then I would write down booster seat on the green one. And then anytime okay. I had an idea for the book that I wanted to make sure made it into the book, I would jot it down on these three by five cards. And then about two or three times a week, I would lay all the three by five cards out in front of me and start working on the order of the concept. So imagine 20 three by five cards spread out around you with different mm. bullet points, if you will, whether it was a character or something you wanted to make sure you said or a concept or something. And then I would just look at them visually and start shuffling them around to put them in the order I thought made most sense for the book, if you can kind of visualize that. And then... I would just revisit it a couple times a week. And I did that for probably, I don't know, a good month or two. And then that gave me kind of the bones for the story, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then, and then once I got the manuscript done and it got picked up, I actually got my author's signature letter. I got that acceptance letter February 12th of 2020. And I don't need to tell you what happened in March of 2020. Okay. Um, so I'd actually got the book picked up before the pandemic. But as soon as it was picked up, the next thing I had to do was find an illustrator. And that was quite the quite the task. Um, I cannot draw a straight line. The irony that I run a design agency is that I cannot draw a straight line at all. I can hire the people who can, but I'm not talented in that way at all. So I had actually illustrated the whole book in these glamorous stick figures with like a rectangle as the bed and the main character is literally just like a stick figure you would draw in hangman and that's how I had done the whole book and then I had to find someone who could make it actually look pretty and so once I found that illustrator he did his versions and we would have a little bit of back and forth feedback and and that's how that came about. And and why did you have to look for the illustrator why not the publisher? They could have provided me um, illustrators. I had seen a lot of the illustration work in some of their other, in some of their other, what am I trying to say? In some of their other children's books that they had published. Yes. And none of it really resonated with me. So I had a couple leads on illustrators myself. I had narrowed it down to two people. And then the two people I had narrowed it down to, I said, well, here's, I sent them the manuscript of the book. Here's what I'm envisioning. Can you draw the main character for me? to put that my paper and my vision uh, or my words and my vision combined with their talent. So the two of them drew the main character and I ended up going with the one who drew the main character that fit most with what I was envisioning. But the publisher absolutely could have given me an illustrator. I just wanted a little bit more control over that process. Okay. So I could have gone that route though. Absolutely. But I, I already had some good leads and I'm glad I went with them. So, so how did you find him? Did you use like an, a platform, a, a marketplace? Um, you know, how, how, how would anyone find illustrators? Um, one, of the, the, one of the two finalists that I found, I had found just through um, one of those, oh, what are they? Like, um, the, like the job sites? Like, marketplace. Fi Fiverr. Fiverr. Yeah, Fiver, one yeah. Of the, yeah, things like that. That's where I found one of them. And um, the other one was just a, a friend of a friend who had written a children's book and he had done the illustrations kind of just through networks mm. of, of people. He was out in Michigan. He probably still is in Michigan. And okay. so, um, so we weren't geographically close, but you know, I mean, we're doing our podcast miles and miles away together, not in the same studio. So that didn't, that wasn't a hindrance at all, but that's, okay. that's how I found the gentleman who ended up being my illustrator, yeah. I actually interviewed uh, an illustrator on on this podcast. If you have the chance to mm. to listen to it, but it's uh, she she did both writing the book and illustrating the book. But uh, you know something. Yeah, to check that was out. I it, think a, a pretty recent episode of yours. Yes, written, yes. Like, or illustrated like 
dozens. Did yes. she like forty yes. some books? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So um, yeah, but she had she had a different process. So I'm I'm curious about mm. how authors have different processes, and this is part of the podcast is to the listeners or the viewers know that you have different options for publishing. Sure. Um, sure. So let's I say don't think there's a right yeah, or ahead. wrong one. Exactly. I exactly. don't think there's a right or wrong one. You know, you really you really need to um, stand up for yourself. I think that's a big a big part of it. Um, I think a lot of authors think, oh, well, the publisher knows best, so I'm just going to do what they say. But it's it's your baby. It's your work. It's your words. So yeah. the, re- the the illustrations are a reflection of your words. So you need to be 110 percent on board with those illustrations. Yeah. W- would you consider self-publishing for, for your next book or would you go with a publisher and would you go with the same publisher? I would not considering self-publishing. I am very much a stay in your own lane kind of girl. I know what I know and I know what I don't know. Okay. And I don't know anything about publishing. <laughs> and I would, I would much rather, um, lose a part of my commission or my sale to someone who knows what they're doing to make my life easier. Um, but, but that doesn't mean it hasn't worked wonderfully for other people. I just know myself, that would not be a good option for me. I would drive myself and probably my whole family crazy. Uh, would I go with the same publisher? I, I have had nothing but an amazing, amazing experience with Morgan James. Okay. That's not to say if another publisher, wanted to pick up a future book that I wouldn't entertain it. But I, I don't have one negative thing to say about Morgan James. They've been terrific. Um, I am very grateful for the time, the extra time that they spent with me as a first time author explaining how things work and how things don't work and what to expect and very realistic about the whole process. They didn't sugarcoat anything. And they, and they very well could have been, right? Because they're not the biggest publisher around. We know that. Uh, and they could have sold me on all kinds of things that may or may not have happened, but they were the opposite. They were very candid and um, nurturing and educational and informative and patient and all the things you hope for in a publisher they've been. Oh, okay. Great. And let's say I'm a, a mom who wants to publish a book now. I have an idea. What What tips would you give me? I just have an idea floating in my head. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, depending on how serious you wanted to be in, in making it into a book, I would, you know, there's nothing wrong with, and at one point I think I did it. I took a bunch of computer printer paper, stapled it together to make the spine of my book, quote unquote. And I wrote the book out and, and how I thought it would go, including what words would be on which pages. And then again, like the most rudimentary version of, um, of illustrations, because what I think that does for us as an unpublished, I think that what that would do for an unpublished author would show you that that idea, that what you might call a silly idea bouncing around in your head could actually become a book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right there, it's just a stapled version of some computer printer paper, but that's not that far away from a real book. And I think it would just make it more tangible and more of an, a real concept and give anyone motivation to then kind of start seeing it through the process a bit more. And then you just need to, I don't, you know, I, in this day and age, you can, while you, while you wouldn't be self-publishing, you can reach out to so many people on your own, either via your own network of friends or colleagues or coworkers as opposed to getting an agent. Um, I've never had an agent, so I guess I don't know how valuable they can be. I also feel like you could get a lot done on your own as far as just getting your book out there without having to pay someone to get your book out there. Mm. So you're saying just use the, the power of visualization to, to get your book out there. So like when you print it out, try a few words, you actually see it and this will m- motivate you to sit down and write it. I think so. I think, I think that's, you know, as far as like step one, step two, step, step three, I think that visually being able to see your book as a rough, rough, rough version of a book and to hold it. And maybe mm. you just take that mock up and give it to a few of your friends and see what they say, or a few of your colleagues based, you know, I guess it depends on what, um, the subject matter is. And then obviously you would need to put something more polished together to, mm. to send it out. 
But a lot of places, you know, when I sent the manuscript to Morgan James, it was literally a, a Word document. There was okay. not one. It was literally a Word document. Okay. And um, and and that was that was the beginning step. So I guess it depends if you are writing a book that needs illustrations, et cetera, et cetera, if you're writing more of a novel. Um, but I still think it helps to, to put a little bit down. There's not a publisher in the world that expects that that initial manuscript you submit is going to be what shows up the day it goes to print. Um, yeah. Actually, they, they would probably guarantee you it wouldn't. What I yeah. sent originally is not what ended up going to print. You tweak it along the way. Um, you know, who, in, the, in that whole writing process, something could have happened in the world that makes part of your book either unacceptable or unapplicable or, you know, you never know. So it stays a bit fluid. But, but just getting it started and getting it visually and, and tangibly in front of you. I think is a great place to start. Hmm. So how would you respond to a mom who tells you, I have an idea, but I just don't have time. You may, we all make time for things we <laughs> want to do. You know okay. what I mean? I don't have time to get my nails done, but I, if I really want to get my nails done, I'm going to get my nails done. I don't have time to work out, but if I really want to work out, I'm going to work out. You know, we all, none of us have enough time to do all the things we want. So you have to start prioritizing and triaging the things that you want to do. I also think a lot of us moms and myself included, don't always use the time we spend in the car as efficiently as we could be. You could dictate your book or your ideas to Siri while you're on your way to pick up or drop off, maybe not to drop off because the kids are still in the car with you, probably making a way too much noise like my, uh, mine do. But, uh, <laughs> but on the way to pick up when you're going to pick them up or sitting there in the pickup line or things like that, you can start either jotting your ideas down on paper or dictating them to your phone mm. or to Siri or to, you know, to whatever device you can just to start. Again, it's, it's just getting that ball rolling and sticking with it and making it something you want to spend your time on. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. I like using Siri while driving. I haven't thought of that, so thank you. <laughs> that's it. That's yeah, the time. No I that's use all the time that, to make my to uh, really? list. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's I get back time. to the house. I'm like Siri, what's my on my to do list? And she tells me. So. Ah, okay. I like that. So, uh, so time hack, I guess. Um, so b b before we conclude, I, I want to touch briefly on marketing. You said you said you, you did the marketing yourself. Did you hire a publicist or did you do it all on your own? And what worked the most for you? Which was it? Which, cha which channel, social media channel, which approach? So I'm just curious to hear that. I have done some of the marketing on my own, but my publisher does a lot of the marketing as well. Um, the marketing that's worked best for me has been uh, Instagram and then in-person events. So I've done I've done a couple readings at my son's school, um, at my son's former preschool. And then when I do those readings to the little kids, I'll put a little flyer in their backpack or the teacher will put a flyer in their backpack or their lunchbox that... Um, they go home with that says, um, you know, former students, mom, Rebecca Linney read to us, da, 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 and then give them like a little discount code. And then I've gotten a lot of sales that way. And then Instagram, because it's, because it's such a, I mean, you have the book there. It's a very colorful, bright, pretty, fun, enticing book cover. Um, And so Instagram being such a visual platform, it's, it's very eye catching. So I get a lot of, um, traction on Instagram when I send the books out from me personally, because you can order the book directly from me on the growingbed.com, or you can do it on all the other channels where you would normally get book or where you can always get books. But if you order it from me, then I can sign it and personalize it and write a little note in it and stuff. So when I fulfill those orders, I also, I, you know, I wrap it up and make it look cute. And then there's a little sticker on there saying, thank you so much for your order. I'd love to see you and your kiddo enjoying this book. If you could tag me on Instagram. And so then people um. around the country have, you know, taken a little picture of, you know, Johnny or Susie reading the book and then they tag me and it's, it's kind of it's come one of those oh. kind of knock on effects. That's, that's a great idea. Um, but you work in marketing, right? As as your as 
as your day job? I work in design. I, I'm, I'm a glorified headhunter, uh, basically, okay, in okay, the design okay. world. Yeah, in okay. the design world. Ah, wow. So when on your Instagram, do you mostly focus on your book or do you discuss other aspects of, of the writing life and the publishing life? It's mostly on the book. Um, it's, okay. uh, it's a lot of old pictures of um, my son via the baby monitor and okay. like one, my husband or I like sleeping on the floor of his nursery, <laughs> trying to get him to go to sleep as long because we were in the room, even though we were sleeping on the floor, then he would sleep. So it's a little bit of, it's a mixture of mom quotes or tips or whatever you want to, you know, I, again, I'm no expert, but my kid's happy and healthy. So I'm obviously doing something (laughs) right. Right. So it's, it's a good mix of promo for the book, mom advice or tips, funny pictures from the past where my son wasn't sleeping things like that. So I, I try, I never take myself too seriously. Um, so I don't expect anybody else to take my words of wisdom uh, as prophecy, but um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit above. That's great. So um, any, any final thoughts be, before we conclude? I, I think one of my final thoughts would be if you have a great idea for a book, because I know you're, you're very much trying to build up um, authors and, is to not be afraid to go for it because there are others out there. When I was talking, I was talking to someone one time and she said, Oh, I've got this great idea for a cookbook, but there's so many cookbooks already out there. Mm. I said, yeah, but think of all the millions of people in the world that have to eat three times a day. There's room for your book. Mm. You know, I wrote a children's book about going to bed. I'm no sleep expert. I'm no child psychologist or psychiatrist or doctor or anything. I'm a mom who had a good idea that worked for my family. So if it can work for my family, it can work for other families. There's room for everybody. There is room for everybody's idea. Um, And it might not resonate with everybody, but I bet you it will resonate with a lot more people than you think, whatever the topic is that you have to talk about. So don't be afraid um, to put yourself out there because you think that that particular market's saturated because there's always there's always someone who will need to know or want to know what you have to share. Yeah, no, that's that's great. That's a, that's a great tip. Thank you. And for um, anyone who's watching or listening, uh, make sure to check out uh, Rebecca Lenny's book, The Growing Bed. It's available on. Amazon, Target, Barnes and Noble, and all the other uh, book selling websites. So, um, and thank you very much for uh, listening to another episode of Read and Write uh, with Natasha. And until we meet again. <laughs>